Okay, so hello everyone. I'm Sarah Thompson from the University of Stirling in Scotland and this is a joint work with my co-author Gabriela Ochoa. So we've been working in a fitness landscape analysis and specifically uh, on the local optimal level within those. Um, we've been doing um, chemotherapy schedule optimization as our domain, which is quite self-evidently important. Uh, and it's also not been subject to fitness landscape analysis previously. So just a brief recap of fitness landscapes. I'm sure everyone here is familiar, but just to be sure. So they're both a visual metaphor and also a mathematical object. So I mean visual metaphor in the sense that they're analogous to real life 3D terrains, you know, in real landscapes. But they're also mathematical objects. So they're composed of three parts. Um, the set of solutions to an optimization problem. The solution fitnesses, which you can view as their heights. I've got a wee visualization here, but it's just an abstraction. Um, and also how the solutions relate to each other in terms of nearness, so a distance function or a neighborhood function. So taking these three components together, um, we have our fitness landscape. Um, so I mentioned that we're, we're focusing on the local optima level in fitness landscapes and a tool to do this is called local optima networks, which some of you have probably heard of already. So we have a graph and this is actually a real local optima network, but not for this problem. Um, so it's of course composed of nodes, nodes and edges. The nodes are the local optima and the edges are local optima transformations under a chosen search operation. You'll notice from the image that um, some of the edges are thicker than others. So this is to represent um, the edges can be weighted with essentially the probability um, of the local optima transformation from uh, the source to the destination uh, taking place in a, in a stochastic uh, search process. I mentioned our domain is chemotherapy schedule optimization. We consider um, for this study a multi-drug uh, chemotherapy treatment regimen. Um, we choose 10 chemotherapy drugs to include in our schedule and there are four set dosages available for each of those. We have 10 time slots in our schedule and then we have a binary representation which is of length uh, of the number of drugs, well the product of the number of drugs, the number of dosage levels and the number of time slots which is as I said 10 times 4 times 10 which is 400. So we have a search space of 2 to the power of 400 for this problem. The fitness function is rather complex. I'm not going to go into it in too much detail, but I will give you its essence. So um, the important part is that it has underlying it um, a tumor shrinkage model called the Gumpert's, Gumpert's growth model, um, which importantly has been um, validated in significant clinical experiments um, in previous literature, so I've got a reference for that there. Um, so that model is essentially how uh, in number of cells, in cell count, a tumor responds to chemotherapy drugs. So our objective here is single objective and it's curative treatment for cancer, so our objective is tumor eradication. So this is actually a maximization problem um, in our case, because although we're reducing um, the tumor cells, so we're, we're reducing the tumor size, we're doing so by maximizing the combined effect of the drugs in our treatment schedule. Um, so by doing so, we um, uh, minimize the tumor. Okay, so due to the nature of this problem, it's subject to constraints, the fitness is subject to constraints. So we do have infeasible solutions in the search space. Um, these are all hard constraints. Okay, the first, the tumor can't exceed a defined size. The cumulative dose of any of our 10 drugs can't exceed the known maximum um, amount of that drug to be in a person's system at any one time um, across the whole treatment schedule. Uh, there's a known limit as well on um, toxic side effects that happen with chemotherapy and that limit can't be exceeded. Um, so we have three constraints, they're hard constraints. If either of these three um, are violated um, in the model, the patient dies and the fitness is less than zero, representing an infeasible solution. 
Um, so penalty functions are applied um, to the fitness where there is one or more constraint violation. Um, so you can get you can get fitnesses. Um, so if it's negative, it's infeasible. But you can get, for example, negative one hundred thousand for solutions in this problem. But you can also get negative seven. So there is sort of a scaling of how badly the constraints have been violated, um, which can be useful for giving you a view of how close a particular solution might be to a feasible region um, where there's no constraint violations. Um, okay, so in better news, um, if no constraints are violated, the fitness is above zero and the patient lives. So the higher it is above zero, um, the more maximal the effects of the combined um, drugs across the schedule, and thus the smaller the tumour. So again, we're maximising the effect of our drugs to minimise our tumour. In terms of like numerical values above zero and what they actually mean, um, I've seen that for this problem, it seems like the expected range of values for feasible solutions is between zero and about 1.7. Um, and again, the higher that is, the better the solution. Okay, so we wanted to extract local optimal networks for this problem. Um, as I mentioned, the search space is two to the power of 400, so rather large. So we can't enumerate the local optima, um, so we need to turn to sampling, of course. Um, a popular way to do this for local optima networks is to augment a metabolistic algorithm um, with the local optima network logging. So that's the approach we take here. So we implement an iterated local search um, algorithm and the parameters are given here in the little table. These are obtained, these are hand-tuned through preliminary, preliminary runs um, and essentially um, this was done with the aim of obtaining a network that's sufficiently large to study, sufficiently dense to study in terms of uh, the number of edges, um, but it's also done in reasonable computational time. Um, okay, so to construct our local optimal network for this problem, so we conduct 30 runs of the ILS um, and for nodes and edges, we track the local optima encountered and we track uh, transitions between local optima as well to record them as edges in our network. The, 30, uh, the nodes and edges from the 30 runs are amalgamated to make a single local optima network for the problem at hand. And if, um, if transitions between uh, local optimum A, let's say, and local optimum B, um, if that edge was followed more than once, that's um, the edge is weighted with that to obtain a probability, a higher probability of, of that happening to include in the network. So that's one of our methods for constructing a local optimal network for this problem. We also constructed um, a different algorithm which is called mimetic long construction. So this is actually, um, it's also taking the approach of something for augmenting with a metaheuristic and it actually has underlying it a genetic algorithm from the literature, the reference for which is at the side there. So we were provided a genetic algorithm from the literature by previous authors, um, and this was very helpful, but it can't be used in its sort of base state for a local optimal network construction algorithm, um, because the model uh, necessitates that the nodes are local optima and that at the end of each edge is a local optimum. So the genetic algorithm made so no such guarantee in its process. Um, thus, we start with that as a base and then we um, add in local search mechanisms to uh, render the algorithm mimetic before making a local optimal network construction algorithm. So the parameters you see in the table there, they're actually for the base genetic algorithm and they're taken from the literature and they actually have done um, statistical uh, inference to obtain those. Okay, so in terms of the mimetic, the lawn construction um, things, so at each generation, uh, the first is 10% are subject to local search. The resulting local optima are recorded as nodes for our network. So the nodes are recombined together and the children again are subject to local search because we need um, the destination uh, node in our network at the end of an edge in our network to be a local optimum. So transitions from parent to child are recorded as local optimum network edges. 
Lastly, um, after 100 generations, pairs of nodes are recursively recombined for 10 iterations. The children are again subject to local search and nodes and edges are added to the lawn accordingly. This last, um, this last part here I added in because um, it ensured that the network was sufficiently dense so it had enough, enough actual connectivity between local optima to study for meaningful structure. So on your results, I'll talk kind of descriptively about the, the local optima networks it obtained first of all. So the mimetic uh, process obtained lawn first. So we have an edge to node ratio of about 10 to 1. The average fitness in the network is above zero, so it's feasible, so the patient lives, so that's, that's great. Um, I did notice from working with this problem and with, for, with algorithms for this problem that the vast majority of solutions appear to be um, not only infeasible, but um, very infeasible. I know that's kind of incorrect terminology, but um, highly penalized solutions, essentially. Um, so um, I've mentioned a pseudo-optimal fitness value here. So that's basically, we don't know the global optimum for this problem. So I obtained the pseudo optimal fitness value by taking the three algorithms I've mentioned so far. So the iterated local search, the mimetic algorithm and the GA from the literature and running them loads of times and finding the best fitness by any of them in any run essentially, which turned out to be 1.71. So that's the kind of benchmark pseudo optimal fitness we're working off of here. Um, so we can see that the average fitness is a, quite a bit less than that, but it is feasible, which is the main thing. So I think that's encouraging. The vast majority of nodes in the network are feasible, but it's also interesting that some of them aren't. So there are local optima which are infeasible. The maximum fitness in the lawn is very good, I would say. It's very, very close to the pseudo-optimal fitness value that we're working off of here. Even more encouragingly, there's in fact 217 distinct solutions with that fitness in the Mimetic Local Optima Network, which would imply to me that the operators used by the Mimetic process may be quite good at exploiting in that highly promising region of the search space. Um, so we're looking at fitness gradients now. So recall that um, an edge in a local optima network is directed from a source to a destination. Um, and uh, if it's an improving edge, then the, the destination has a superior fitness, basically. We can see that a sig quite significant portion ha is in this category, so is improving um, in this network, so that's encouraging. There's a, there's, a, there's a significant portion as well that are deteriorating, but that's not that surprising given that there's no acceptance condition to speak of um, for children being accepted when produced by the parents. Um, lastly, we found evidence of a hub and spoke network architecture within this local optima network. Um, so precisely, we found that there was a single node with an excessive uh, degree, so an excessive amount of connectivity, and then there was a lot of nodes with much smaller degree. The iterated local search one, so we have a higher edge to node ratio here. Okay, so we have an average fitness in this lawn, which is again feasible because it's above zero, but it is a little bit lower than we saw in the mimetic lawn. Um, and it's a little bit, well, it's a, fair, it's a fair bit lower than our pseudo optimal fitness value, but still feasible. The maximum fitness though is very good as well. And again, very close to the pseudo optimum. Um, in this case, however, um, in, when comparing to the mimetic lawn, a um, higher proportion of edges are in fact deteriorating, um, which is somewhat discouraging um, because during the construction process for this, if uh, in the iterated local search, if a uh, deteriorating local optimum um, was found, it was only accepted 5% of the time. You can see that 64% of the edges are in fact deteriorating here. There was evidence um, against the helmet spoke network, network architecture here. So the ed edges were much more uniformly distributed and the average degree was moderate, kind of around 17 to 20 ish for, for, for nodes. Okay, so feasibility gradients. So um, to the best of my knowledge, local optimal networks have not previously been used on constrained problems and thus there's not really been a study using them to gain insight into 
um, how to maybe get out of infeasible regions and search space into feasibility. So we wanted to kind of assess what local electro networks could do for this cause. Um, so we're looking at feasibility gradients, so kind of just the proportion of edges in the networks, which, um, so for example, if you've local optimum A and it's directed with an edge towards local optimum B, what's the feasibility status of both of those uh, local optima? So the iterated local search law, and first of all, I'm just going to point out a couple of things here. So the first uh, rule there, so we have the orientation of um, the edges and we have the proportion that fit that, that uh, classification. So we have feasible towards feasible um, and we have a rather small proportion of edges fitting this category at 5%. So that may imply that the ILS operators are not the best at kind of exploiting within a really promising region of the search space at the local optimal level. In the fourth row here we have the infeasible towards feasible which is an important a very important one um, debatably the most important um, because it represents really port like op the operators finding portals out of infeasible regions towards feasibility um, and we can see that 77 percent of the edges fit this um, classification which i think is very encouraging um, in terms of the operators used and their effectiveness with the interactions with the problem. So let's compare it with the monetic one um, proportions. Uh, we'll look at the same rules actually. So again we've got the feasible towards feasible in the first row and whereas it was a low proportion in the ILS loan it's actually the vast majority in the mimetic loan. I would interpret this personally as um, it seems the mimetic operators are very good at exploiting within the highly promising region of the search space and at the local optimal level. Um, again, to a fourth row here, and remembering that in the ILS one we got we had 77% proportion. Here we have a much lower proportion. Um, so this could say that um, perhaps the mimetic operators, while they seem to be good at exploiting, at the local optimal level, they may not be as good at, at finding portals out of infeasible regions um, towards feasibility. So we wanted to see as well um, which kind of combination of operators was best in the interactions with um, this problem. So we have three that we've mentioned. So we have the genetic algorithm from the literature. So that's one of them. We also have um, the two algorithms we implemented for the purposes of lawn construction, which were our iterated local search and a mimetic algorithm. Um, so we take all three of these um, and we do optimization runs. Um, so we do a few different configurations. Um, I'll talk about them in a wee minute actually. But essentially, so for the iterated local search, the parameters largely remain the same, edited slightly for computational reasons. Um, the same for the mimetic algorithm and for the genetic algorithm that's from the literature as I mentioned in the parameters have been previously stated as well. So we um, tried a few different configurations for comparing the algorithms. Um, so the metric of performance we're looking at here is um, the uh, end best fitness that they obtain. So remember when looking at the results that anything less than zero is infeasible. Um, and we're looking for as high as possible, so maximizing above zero essentially. Um, and um, so we tried um, we tried seeding um, the algorithms with the same solution. Um, we tried not seeding them with the same solution. We also tried um, unbudgeted runs, so we allowed all of the algorithms to kind of run in their default configuration. Um, and we also tried budgeted runs where we gave each of them 50,000 function evaluations to approximate fairness in some way. Although, of course, the evolutionary approach is used more memory. But nonetheless, um, so we did find that the, each of these um, four kind of combinations of seeded and budgeted and unbudgeted and unseeded um, runs um, produced um, in essence very similar results. So I'm going to show just a subset of them but they're reflective of kind of the larger set. So we're showing here the where we have budgeted each of them 50,000 uh, function evaluations um, and we're just comparing the three algorithms. Again we're looking at fitness values here 
Um, so we've got a rule for each algorithm. And so this is uh, over 100 runs. So we just got the minimum, the median, and the maximum of those 100 runs um, under that budget. So a few things here. So we can see that our mimetic algorithm is kind of far and away the best here. So even, um, even the minimum um, of those 100 runs um, was feasible. Um, and we can see that it's the maximum was very close to our pseudo optimal fitness value. So basically the whole distribution was feasible in terms of the end fitnesses they obtained. Um, the iterated local search, so its maximum is feasible and also quite good, but not quite as good as the mimetic algorithm. So it's that bit lower. Um, and the minimum and median, while they're infeasible, they're not as low as the genetic algorithm from the literature where we see very, very penalized um, end solutions, basically. And we can see that even the maximum in the GA from the literature is in fact infeasible fitness. Um, yeah. So conclusions. Okay, so we saw that the iterated local search lawn has a larger proportion of deteriorating fitness gradients than our mimetic lawn. The mimetic lawn, I said that it was encouraging that it has many distinct solutions with this very high fitness, um, which was very close to the pseudo optimal fitness. The mimetic optimization seemed to be very good at exploiting feasible regions at the local optimal level, but perhaps not the best at escaping or finding portals out of infeasible regions. The iterated local search optimization seemed to be better at finding portals out of infeasible regions. By far the best optimization, as we saw in the last slide, was uh, mimetic optimization. So that kind of killer combination of recombination random mutation and local search. So both of our algorithms to the ILS and the mimetic optimization um, outperformed the GA from the literature as well. So here are the references. So they, they're um, essentially the, the tumor growth model I mentioned and the clinical experiments. Um, the parameters for the used in the GA and the mimetic uh, algorithm and then the GA itself from the literature. So that's me and thank you all very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you. I think we have some time for questions. Okay. Oh, whoops. Sorry, okay. let me go back into this. Uh, I have one, if I can. Sure. Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, I saw that there are some edges that say that they're going from the feasible region to the infeasible region in ILS. Uh, I guess these edges, uh, which are uh, should be deteriorating in most of the cases, unless the fitness function is not to penalize it well, uh, these constraints, right? Um, sorry, can you repeat that? Sorry. Yeah, I'm so, so the, the edges that we can see in the ILS, in the results of the ILS, that are going from solutions in the feasible region to solutions in the infeasible region, um, I have seen 4% uh, of these edges there. Oh, right, yes, 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 sorry. So my question is, are they deteriorating edges, uh, or is it just that the fitness function is not uh, well penalized and you are having infeasible uh, solutions that are better than feasible solutions? Oh, so it's basically because of the sampling process. So um, the acceptance condition for the ILS is basically um, if it encounters uh, an improving uh, no, uh, local optimum, it always accepts it. But if it's a deteriorating local optimum that it encounters, it accepts it 5% of the time. So I think that would account for why you get edges that are from infeasible to feasible, uh, sorry, from feasible to infeasible, because you, it is accepting deteriorating local optima some of the time. Okay, so, so you accept some of them? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. Okay, thanks. That answered my question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry, I am trying to share my screen again, but it's saying it's failing, so I can't really <laughs> show my slides, but I'll answer as best I can. Okay, so there is a, a question in the chat. So from Hui Ma, thanks for the interesting talk. Do you use the same penalty for both constraints? Um, so the penalty, so this isn't, I didn't implement the penalty functions myself, it's uh, in the code that was given to me, but to my knowledge from looking at the code, it's, uh, no, there are different penalties for the, the three different 
um, constraints. I can't remember which is the most heavily penalized, but I think it's backed up by, so I think it's, it's actually derived from kind of interviews with clinicians a fairly long time ago, but I wasn't involved with this. So I don't know off the top of my head, but I know that they are penalized differently. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, you. Have time, time for one short question. Uh, I can just ask one thing very, very short. So uh, I guess that your variables are um, a binary, right? Yeah, yeah. So is it uh, when you compute this transformation between lock and Lottima, this is basically like amming distance or? Um, so this is, um, okay, so it depends on the, whether it's the iterated local search, um, oh, sorry, hamming distance, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's based, so an edge basically in the iterated local search um, uh, model, uh, an edge would represent uh, essentially one, like one iteration of perturbation operator followed by local search. Um, so it would be the perturbation operator I, I, I mentioned on the slides, um, followed by the local search, and those together would represent an edge. Whereas on in the uh, mimetic algorithm, um, it's uh, a product of recombination and also local search. So, so in both cases, the edges represent kind of a sequence of, of search operations, basically. Um, but um, yeah, so it is, it is having distance, yeah, but is it, they're based on the kind of algorithmic uh, okay. operations, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Just one last question from E. May. So thanks, as I understand, LON is analyzing algorithm behavior. How yeah. would this help with algorithm design selection? Thanks. Oh, it's a very good problem. Um, so this is something that kind of we want to look into. Um, so I think with, um, so we've used in other papers, we've used LON uh, features basically for algorithm prediction using random forest and other things with, with some success. Um, so you can extract uh, features and use them for prediction that way. Um, the only problem is it's quite computationally expensive. Obviously, you do the sort of a lot of computation and you do sort of like a feature extraction online and you do machine learning, um, sorry, offline, and then you do machine learning offline um, and then you use that to make um, a prediction about algorithms. Another option would be kind of doing it on the fly, which isn't something we've done yet. So you could do um, a local Optima network at like a sort of partial extraction as you're optimizing and then maybe make like operator switches or parameter configuration online. Um, but in terms of algorithm selection, yeah, I think there's a lot of um, potential using the features of LONs to kind of, something I think would be, we'd, would be helpful would be if we could like, say by, if we could obtain a sort of problem class uh, to algorithm mapping using LON features, I think that'd be quite helpful. So that's something we want to work towards. So thank you for your question. Sorry, that was a long answer. No, it was okay. Thank you very much, Sarah. I think we can stop for now. Um, so don't forget, so we have the second session in roughly one hour. Okay, so thank you very much to all the speakers and the attendees. It was a very lively discussion. I enjoy very much. See you, bye-bye.